Greetings, ladies and gents, and welcome to this narration of the book Introduction to Human Biology, taken from Reddit. If you're new to the series, there is a playlist down below, and as always, I hope that you enjoy. Chapter 4 The next morning, as far as mornings go on space stations, Lysona barely made it to class on time, and she was not particularly excited to sit in Mr. Florcher's military strategy class. As luck would have it, however, the teacher was late himself. The classroom was a large and metallic room with plenty of seating apparatus of various types, and when Lasona entered, she noticed a different smell was present, as well as a different mood from the other students. Scanning the room, she saw that she was hoping for. Humans, even better than, one of them was sitting in her seat, giving her an excuse to go talk to them. Within three strides, she was standing over the human seated in a custom-made seat. It was far too big for the human, and he resembled an infant sitting in an adult's chair. Towering over him were the near three meters, depending on if he counted horns or not. She looked at him with a smirk. All right, being commander of the situation, show him you're strong and independent, and he wouldn't have to worry about you if you were his mate. He pushed back a bit, naturally, maybe saying that he was there first, then she'd reluctantly concede, letting him have it while making him feel like she owes her. That'll get him interested, she thought. You're in my spot, human. As if someone called for a fight, every alien in the class turned around to look at the confrontation. Dwayden was notoriously short-tempered, and many wondered how the human would react. The human looked up and seemed a bit confused, then scared, then hurriedly got out of her seat and began apologizing. The translator covering its odd sounds into words, Oh, I I'm terribly sorry I didn't know her. I hope it didn't cause any offense. Lysona blinked a few times, the wind taken out of her sails. She sat down, wondering what went wrong. Humans were notoriously violent, judging from what she'd read in their history. They committed atrocious acts even upon one another, and often reacted violently or with defiance to those that wronged them. As she mulled over these thoughts, she felt a physical contact on her left side and turned to look. It was another human, but this one seemed to have fire in his eyes. The other human tried to prevent him from speaking to Lysona, but he did so anyway. Hey man, if you're like uh, this huge lizard thing, that was not cool. What came out sounded a bit different to Lysona than the other aliens. Friendly greeting, fellow male, calculating for your size and species, that action was reprehensible. This was what she'd wanted, what she had expected from the humans. Everyone in the situation at the academy is so meek towards her, hardly able to express a differing opinion. It was a reputation her kind had earned over the years that made crossing Dwayden usually a bad choice. She elected to ignore the insult that she was a male and replied, But this is my seat. It was created especially for me. No other seating object in this room would be adequate for me. Realization slowly dawned on the human's face, and it put one of its hands on its chin, considering her words. Well, uh, that makes sense, I guess. Uh, sorry about that. It then went back into the other human, which proceeded to physically smack the braver one on the shoulder, then seated themselves on the floor, resting their bodies on the wall at the back of the class. She kept noticing their furtive glances every so often, trying not to get caught by her. Slightly disappointed, she turned her gaze to the front. The teacher finally arrived in class, exhausted and out of breath. A went low. Mr. Florge stood out in a crowd due to a white carapace that covered his whole body, along with an array of six eyes that enabled his species to have 360 degrees of vision. The teacher looked around the class and finally found what he was looking for. There you are. We've been looking all over the place for you humans. It took a few more breaths, stabilizing its body from the short, intensive burst of energy that it expended. How did you know to come here? We were supposed to come and fetch you. One of the smaller humans seated at the front next to another human spoke. We asked other students where class was being held and followed the directions here. Oh, you can already read Galactic Common. Excellent. Getting multiple species to agree on any one thing was quite an arduous task. 
but after half a century, they had managed to get some semblance of a universal symbol identification system by using a periodic table of elements. Under a microscope, all elements look the same, no matter the species. As such, this was the best way to recognize a symbol from one species to another. Every symbol of an element corresponded to a letter of a species alphabet or equivalent system. For example, hydrogen could mean letter first from the beginning of the list. Such a system was needed in order to label electronics or locations. The Sofen scientists were working on a workaround to use the translator for such tasks as well. But it wasn't ready yet and would need an optical component to properly work. Well, no matter. It seems everything is in order. May we have your names, please? On the right side of the class, a human stood up. I am Azumi. Pleased to meet you. She bowed before sitting back down. The student next to her then stood up. My name is Laura. I am from Germany. I look forward to learning. In the back, the two humans leaning against the wall stood up together, then conferred amongst each other to see who was going first. Hey guys, I am name's Barry. I come from America. I hope that we get along good. And lastly, the final human smoke. Hello, I'm Jean-Francois. I'm happy to be here, and I'll do my best to meet your expectations. Clapping his four hands together, something similar to a smile showed his face. Allow me to officially welcome you to Tar Mina Academy of Students. I am in charge of the student military program, so feel free to ask me if you have any questions. The smallest human called Izumi lifted a hand. Is there a specific arrangement for seating? Oh, they didn't make seats for you, did they? Now get it fixed by tomorrow. They will be custom made according to your size. You may then place your seat where you wish in this room. The human nodded, writing down a note on her electronic device. With a bit of extra work and some help, they now could connect to the ship's local communication system, allowing the teachers to send information to them. Now let us jump into it, shall we? Today we are looking at potential wartime scenarios and what plans or actions could be used to achieve victory. Here is the scenario, a strategic mine is in enemy hands, and possessing the mine would be helped turn the tides, but the system is heavily defended. How do you proceed? Use your pads to write an answer. You have 13 minutes and 49 seconds, then we'll present before the class. Using their electronic devices, the students got to work. However, the human students paused and looked at each other and then the teacher. Is uh, there a problem, humans? The one named Laura spoke. Um... Are there rules? You must follow the laws of physics, cannot use technology not yet invented, and are limited to what your species has access to. Jean-Francois cut in before Laura could muster a reply. No, uh, we mean more like uh, actions not allowed, crime, something that would be breach of some law. Confusion was apparent on the teacher's face, which in and of itself spoke volumes regarding the answer. This is war. There are no rules. Some rules get applied after the fighting is over, co most commonly by the victors. How can rules be imposed before the winner is decided? That's all we needed to know. Thank you. A few intensive minutes of writing followed, with some head scratching as well. This was a rather uncommon for human learning, especially for their level of education this was meant to be. Still, they performed the task as instructed. All right, time's up. Any volunteers? A yarn student got up, puffing his chest, standing before the class with his pad. He showed his work. Using superior yarn lasers, which can strike at three times the range of other lasers, I would snipe them until they were forced to retreat and then simply land troops taking over the mine. The teacher nodded, taking the student's plan into consideration. A straightforward and decisive approach. Excellent. Any thoughts in the matter, class? Most seemed satisfied with the answer, only the human showing some signs of dissatisfaction with the answer. Unable to hold himself back, Jean-Francois lifted a hand. Ah, yes, um, Jean-Francois, your, your thoughts? The idea seems rather straightforward, but what would happen if the enemy also had such lasers, or other types of weapons with a similar range? The scenario seemed to imply that the enemy possessed more ships than us. The teacher signaled to Hebthort the yarn, letting him answer. Then more ships and lasers always has worked before. Why wouldn't it now? How about you show us how a human would do it? Jean-Francois wasn't a fan of presentations, even less so in front of dozens of aliens. But when life gave you lemons, he moved to the front, 
taking position where Heb thought was and cleared his throat before commencing. Well, I have two ideas. The first one is cheaper, but it has more ways that it could go wrong. Using spies, I'd infiltrate the enemy nation. Using them to covertly change the destination of the mine shipments, making them deliver it to me instead. The other plan, given that you mentioned the system is heavily defended, would be to tow in an asteroid and hurl it at the mine's location. It would mean that we do not get the advantage, but we also negate the enemies, having spent fewer resources. Mr. Florge seemed rather shocked by his ideas, but nonetheless applauded. That was a very interesting take on our scenario. The excellent even. How about Ashro? The Noir laying down in a small circular pillow at the back stretched, extending his front paws all the way. Eshro got up on all fours and headed to the front, taking Jean-Francois's place. Using a smaller fleet, I would initiate contact with the enemy, making them chase us before striking with the rest of my fleet on their flank when they least expect it. The teacher thanked him for his idea and asked for a volunteer, hiding one in Laura. Thank you. Using a smaller ship, I would slip past the enemy, detonating nuclear weapon five kilometers from the surface. Miners all die. When the enemy fleet go away, we mine the minerals using special equipment to protect against radiation. If the small ship can sneak by, use it as a suicide ship in a large fleet. Bomb doesn't do much in a vacuum, but radiation would fry most electronics. The teacher blinked a few times, making sure he heard correctly. A nuclear weapon, uh, what is that? Laura thought about how to explain it in a simple way. Hmm, it's splitting an atom. I'm only a layman. Uh, it, it would be hard to explain. It is done with an element that is near critical mass, uh, if, if that helps. Uh, I see. I shall have to look into this. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Do we have another? Uh, oh. Most of the other students had now put away their works, looking expectantly at the remaining two humans. Izumi found everyone in the room looking at her and blushed slightly before getting her composure back, getting up to do a presentation. Hello, um, if the enemy holds superior numbers and greater military might, then the solution is to target the population and economy, developing a virus that specifically attacks that species. I'd first deploy it at the mine's location. If they still persist in defending that system afterwards, I would then target the agricultural sectors, forcing them to spread their fleets or risk having riots occur on their homeworlds due to feud shortages. An intriguing concept. I think we should be a, a small pause. Everyone's free to go eat something, and we'll continue after 72 minutes. Jean Francois found it odd how specific the time specified was, but calculated that one human hour would likely be just an odd to them. His stomach growled, having eaten the last of his Earth rations more than eight hours ago. He was very excited, however, as the prospect of trying alien cuisine. As the students began leaving the class, the teacher signaled at the humans to wait a moment, using his palm as a way to stop them. A moment of your time, if I may. I just want to make sure you are indeed human students, correct? Not experts in your respective fields. Barry answered that question. Oh, yeah. We're all going into a year in either college or university. Florage mulled over the words spit out by the translator. What do you intend by place of higher learning? Can you tell me more about human education? We start off in pre-kindergarten at like uh, four years old, moving up into primary school until sixth grade. Then it's high school for another sixth until twelfth grade. When we then proceed to either college or university when we're at 18 and adults. Then it can vary a lot depending on the degree. I see, uh, that is a lot of learning. You spend nearly one fourth of your life studying then. That does explain some things. Most of the other species mature much faster than humans, reaching the equivalent of adulthood in four human years. They're usually taught the basics that they'll need and only ever learn advanced matters if their works require it. Laura stepped up and quickly without question. Are other species in general less educated than us? I would not say so, no. We tend to devote all of our efforts to the geniuses as they are more likely to provide results. In a way, these classes at the academy are more similar to your early high school years. If a student shows promise in a certain field, only then are they devoted the resources needed in order to train them. Otherwise, it would be a waste of time and credits. Finding students that possess the spark for our paramount goal... It is those students who propel us forward into the new inventions and innovations. Anyhow, thank you for enlightening me. 
Please go eat. You'll find your provisions area on the deck, room 116. The humans excused themselves and walked together. Laura seemed to be the one taking this the worst. I can't believe it. They have such technology, and the students are this far behind. What are we even going to learn here? Razumi tried to console her. If, um, the difficulty of the material is lesser, that does not make it inferior. We have much we can learn. There are dozens of new cultures, and their way of doing things including unknown biology and likely elements as well. Laura grumbled as her assent, but still seemed sour. They'd reached the provisions room, as their teacher had mentioned, still seeing the small line of students waiting their turn. At least queuing was something that they had in common. They watched as students from different species left with trays filled with vegetables or fruits, some even having large slabs of raw meat on them. The line moved rather quickly, and they soon found themselves at the front, looking at an alien with six arms that looked awfully a lot like their teacher. Behind a counter, it stood next to many boxes and asked them what they wanted. Meat or vegetables? Jean-Francois was appalled at the offering. Ah, sir, you don't cook anything. The only available food is raw stuff. The provisioner seemed intrigued by this line of questioning, but also baffled by the human's words. If you want me to start a fire, look, tell me what you want to eat. I'll go fetch it. Meat for predators is some assortment of fruits and vegetables for the others. This was a drop that made a glass of water overflow. It was one thing to be stuck on a space station with an odd aliens, but not having cooked food. The French heritage and Jean Francois cried at the injustice and rallied in the humanity of it. The hell with decorum. If he couldn't have a cooked food, he would go crazy. Give me both and I'll figure it out myself, he spat with more venom than intended. Omnivores were a rather rare breed, but the provisioner was aware of them and gave in to the human's request, if only to get rid of him. Jean Francois's fellow students settled for vegetables and fruits while he went on a mission to find a source of heat and a metal container. End of chapter. Just a quick shout out to the T5 peeps Bob the Dragon, Cat Crab Lobster, Data Magnet, Dark Machine, Bezik, Try Again 95, Feudic Yol, Astrea the Dreamer, Caspar Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, Athelia, Meridian 117, and Jordan Buxmorm. Thank you very much. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed. There are links down below both to support this channel and for the author of this fiction. Anyways, I hope you all have a fantastic one, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.